Hi, I'm Emily Carter. I'm the director of the Anlinger Center for Energy and Environment here at Princeton. And I am delighted to welcome you to uh, a very provocatively titled talk, The Future of Energy. And um, we're really delighted to have with us um, Peter Evans, who is uh, the director of global strategy and planning at GE Energy. Um, before I, uh, I'm really afraid I'm going to forget to say this, this uh, talk is being videotaped, so consider your questions carefully, um, because they will be recorded, okay? Uh, anyway, with that small caveat, let me just tell you a little bit about Peter. I, I should say that I learned that he has energy in his blood, and what I mean by that, that sounds like a mixed metaphor, um, and I would say it's energy all the way from hydro to oil. Okay, so his, uh, his family uh, built um, hydroelectric plants, two of them, okay, uh, which is remarkable. And he has been in, engaged and in, in involved in, uh, in thinking about the solutions for how we're going to provide energy for the planet uh, for a very long time. Um, says he's a PhD, I want to tell you because I, I recognize many of you as, as scientists and engineers, he's a PhD, in, has a PhD in political science from MIT. <laughs> it's wonderful to see a political scientist thinking about these issues in a, in a very serious way. We spent actually 10 years working um, in, uh, with Daniel Jurgen uh, in his group at MIT. Many of you know about Daniel Jurgen uh, as being one of the foremost thinkers of, about petroleum, for example, the prize, uh, and, and more recently he, he, he's come out with another book that, that uh, is very thoughtful on these issues. I, I don't want to spend too much time, take time away from your talk, but I do want to say that um, he really does, Peter Evans clearly has tremendous street cred. He also spent time in Japan working for um, the, to uh, the um, Tokyo Electric Power. Central Research Institute for Electric Power. The Central Institute. Research, yeah. So he's very familiar with the nuclear industry in in um, in that country, and obviously that's of great interest. Um, and he's written widely on uh, the issues related to, ener to energy. His, he, in terms of his training, he has a bachelor's degree um, in government and public policy from Hampshire College, and a uh, master's in city planning, focusing on economic development. He's also very concerned about um, the emerging countries and how the emerging countries are going to um, be able to uh, be provided for in a way that, that uh, hopefully preserves the planet. So without further ado, please uh, help me welcome you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be. It's my uh, first trip to Princeton. Uh, obviously, for years, I've heard a lot about Princeton and have worked uh, with a number of people from Princeton. One of my uh, colleagues who works for me is uh, David Malcolm. He graduated from Princeton. So uh, seeing the good work that he does for me, I uh, have very high expectations and learned a lot about all the activity that's taking place uh, here today. Um, what I'd like to do is just briefly tell you a little bit about uh, GE Energy, and then I'd like to launch into um, some of the work that we've been doing to try to understand the future of energy. Um, it's a very dynamic, it's, it's a global uh, industry, there's a lot going on, and so what I'd like to do is to share with you in the next hour um, some of the insights that we have about how the global energy industry is evolving, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities, uh, that are emerging. So without further ado, um, just briefly, uh, GE Energy is about 25% of GE's revenues. Um, it consists of three major business units, which is our power and water business. Uh, a couple of years ago, we combined our water business with our power uh, business, so that's in, uh, created some interesting dynamics. Uh, we have an oil and gas business that is involved in a whole array of technologies from subsea to uh, onshore applications, a lot of compression pipeline work as well, and then an energy management business that includes um, business units, uh, including digital energy, which does the uh, smart grid activities of the business. Uh, we just acquired 
uh, a company called Convert Team that does a lot of work on uh, conversion technology, electricity conversion technology. So uh, three big business units is a very large enterprise, uh, about 100,000 employees. We have over 13,000 engineers. So it's, uh, and we do business in over 100 country, uh, countries around the world. So uh, big, interesting enterprise and a very diverse portfolio of products ranging from uh, gas turbines, which I think many people are uh, well aware of, um, distributed power, so these are smaller gas engines, um, electrification, so we do uh, low voltage, uh, medium voltage equipment, uh, water technologies, water treatment, purification, and uh, chemicals as well for treating water. Uh, smart grid, as I mentioned, um, we have a very large wind business, um, solar, we just announced last year uh, the construction of the largest solar manufacturing facility in the U.S. Um, so uh, we're launching uh, uh, thin film technology there. Um, asset health, this is all around using uh, measurement and sensing technology to understand uh, dynamics around pipelines and, and other applications to understand the, uh, the, uh, the quality and the health of those assets. Um, enhanced oil recovery and subsea systems for our oil and gas business. So a very diverse portfolio which forces you to think broadly about what's happening around the world and a whole array of things that are happening uh, in the energy space and particularly the trade-offs between uh, different applications and different uh, technologies. So with that, let me uh, launch into some of the big trends that are emerging. Um, one is the concentration of oil and gas resources. Um, and so there will be um, around, you know, in the next uh, 10 years or so, 80% of the oil and gas development will take place just in 16 countries. So a pretty profound concentration of where those resources are, which raises all sorts of questions about uh, geopolitics and, you know, the uh, volatility of oil prices and things of that nature. So to understand the, the energy space, you got to bring those um, conditions uh, to bear. Um, also, there is, uh, we're at a transition point right now where the advanced industrial countries, Japan, the United States, and uh, Europe, uh, were really the center of energy consumption. That is transitioning now, and so we're seeing right now an inflection point where the uh, emerging countries now are going to be, from now uh, into the future, the largest source of consumption, and we're right now at that inflection point. And so uh, the world is shifting in terms of where the action is in the global energy industry, industry from the advanced industrial countries really to the emerging markets where a tremendous amount of infrastructure is being built out. Um, right now, the global energy footprint is very large and it's being added to at a pretty amazing rate. So in 2011, uh, we estimate that there were about uh, $1 trillion invested in global energy infrastructure. So that breaks out at about $340 billion in uh, electricity-related uh, investment and about uh, $685 billion in oil and gas investment. By 2014, we expect that to raise to about $1.2 trillion. So you can see that that uh, investment of energy infrastructure around the world is very large and is just growing incrementally. So uh, those are two big dynamics. Um, over the next 15 years, there are certain things that we're pretty certain about what will happen, right? From demographic trends, we know that there will be a billion people added to the planet. So by 2025, we'll have another billion people uh, uh, to share the planet with us. Um, emerging markets, their share of the global economy will grow to 60%. Right now, the world is split uh, roughly evenly between uh, the share of the global market between the advanced industrial countries and the emerging markets. By uh, <clears throat> 2025, the emerging markets will have a larger share of the global economy. Primary energy consumption um, has been built over the last uh, century, really, on fossil fuels. That will continue over the next 15 years, and so by 2025, uh, primary energy consumption will still be predominantly hydrocarbon based, so 80%. Um, power related carbon emissions are rising dramatically in the emerging markets, and we anticipate that uh, they will constitute 70% of the carbon emissions. Um, there's a lot of th 
things that are happening around data and uh, the around amount of data that's being created. We expect that the volume of annual electronic data generated will increase by 30 times. Um, and, you know, the world is buffeted on a regular basis by natural disasters. There are about 800 that happen every year. So between now and the year 2025, we can anticipate if the trend rates continue, uh, the world will be hit by uh, about 12,000 natural disasters. So the global energy industry has to deal with uh, that normal occurrence of natural disasters. Now, those are the things that we can be certain of. There's a whole range of things that we're less certain about, and let me just run through of them. One is the rate of GDP growth. We don't know exactly how that's gonna play out over the next 15 years. Fuel demand, how much fuel is gonna be required to drive the global economy. Um, electricity demand, capital investment, how much capital is gonna be invested. The pace of innovation, right? It, it ebbs and flows over time, and we don't know exactly how um, that rate will play out in the coming years and how much venture capital will be there, you know, how much innovation, have we reached a plateau or are we just set to go on another uh, trajectory? Um, renewable energy jobs, you know, that's been a big issue. How many of those jobs will be created? Um, and water use, uh, water is becoming increasingly constrained, you know, how much water is going to be available? Um, and so that sets up really what my job is about, which is trying to figure out um, how do you decipher that fog, and the further you go out into the future, the denser that fog becomes, and the harder it is to see where to go. And if you're in a company and you're trying to make big bets on uh, being successful and sustaining a business uh, and being impactful in the world, uh, you try to make your best bets, but you have to do so in, basically in this fog. So um, the question is, how do you get beyond that? And you have to think creatively, and so what I like to do is kind of set out some ways of thinking about the future that try to grapple with this uh, challenge. So one way that the world could unfold is what we call the global grind. And the global grind would be a situation in which particularly the OECD countries get trapped in a low growth situation in which um, the economy is, you know, it just doesn't recover, you don't get that jobs growth, the financial markets remain impaired, um, capital doesn't get unleashed, you know, psychology matters to markets as well, and so that psychology doesn't become, uh, doesn't turn and become more positive. And when you have problems of job growth and whatnot, you can get um, uh, strong pressures on governments to protect markets, and so protectionism can increase. And so under these conditions, <clears throat> Um, you're likely to get uh, less aggregate demand, uh, weaker uh, commodity prices as a consequence, and it also has political consequences in the sense that uh, people become more concerned about regenerating economic growth and let, pay less attention to the environment. And we're seeing that happen actually today uh, with the failure of Copenhagen and some of these other uh, global agreements and the whole shift in the United States and, and, and the rise of climate change den denier and, and all of that. So this is one uh, possible future, um, and there's lots of implications for the global energy industry if we uh, proceed down this path. Now, um, there's another possible future, and that's um, what we call fast blue. So fast blue would be a resumption of economic growth um, you would see commodity prices continue to be relatively high, but not spiky like we had seen in 2007, 2008. Um, natural gas is already beginning to take off in this world. You would see that, that trend continue in a quite profound way. We've seen a lot of um, digital innovation taking place around social media and the whole consumer sector. Um, some interesting things that could happen in the next 15 years in which that innovation begins to translate itself in a much bigger way into the industrial infrastructure. And so this whole digital wave could become more deeply enmeshed um, into uh, what we call the industrial internet. Um, and then finally, water stewardship, really grappling with water constraints and investing more in water. So let me walk you through some of the implications of uh, a fast blue world in particular. So around natural gas, you know, 10 years ago, 
Some people were proposing uh, natural gas as a bridge fuel, um, that it could be a useful transition until you got to that stage in which it would, um, you know, renewables and nuclear would come in. And I think um, some developments, particularly with shale and what is really leading to um, a shift in thinking in which gas may become not just a bridge fuel, but a destination fuel. And it may be here for much longer than people uh, realize. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very abundant, it's a very decentralized, unlike uh, the oil that I mentioned, just 16 countries, gas is pretty widely distributed around the world. So a lot of different uh, dynamics uh, associated with gas. So there's an interesting shift taking place. Um, and in this fast blue world that I'm trying to articulate, um, we would see that and the policy implications associated that with that uh, would help um, drive uh, a whole set of policies that could uh, promote gas in a much bigger way. One of the interesting things is that when you look at prices of gas around the world, um, <clears throat> back through 2000, they were pretty much in a tight band. You know, prices in the U.S. weren't all that different from prices in Europe and Asia, but we're seeing a big differential emerge, right? And so very, very low gas prices in the United States right now versus Europe and in Asia. Um, and, and so the United States, because of the shale gas revolution and the tremendous amount of supply that's being brought into the market, has created a real competitive advantage for the United States. We're almost like a gas island where there's too much supply and there's not enough demand and so prices have tanked, but it also gives the U.S. Um, some very interesting uh, lower cost price advantages. So there's more abundant supply, lower prices, um, it's changing the... Uh, power plant economics, and so gas can compete actually uh, in many ways head-to-head -head with coal in a way that was more difficult for it to do in the past, and it's helping uh, to create a rethink in U.S. energy policy. Uh, not uh, last year, was it last year? It was last year that uh, President Obama uh, made a State of the Union address in, in which he defined uh, clean energy in a new way rather than just defining it narrowly in terms of renewables um, he also included natural gas in that uh, equation. So we're seeing now uh, a, 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 sh a reshaping of that, and the U.S. is particularly well positioned um, to take advantage of this. Now, you can't paint a whole fast blue world just by looking at the United States, so what I want to do is walk through the rest of the world to talk about what would need to happen to really see an acceleration of gas. One is um, obviously uh, this sustainability of the shale gas here. And so there's a, a variety of issues that have been raised regarding um, the environmental uh, externalities, particularly the water uh, issues. So for this fast blue world to evolve, you'd need to come in with a set of regulations to create a sustainable uh, industry with um, uh, manageable environmental impacts. Um, in Asia, um, China and India have really not had aggressive pro-gas policies. Um, and there's a whole set of things you can do in terms of pricing, uh, pipeline development, and, and other things. And so in a fast blue world, we would see these countries shift to that. And there's some indications that's actually uh, happening. And that's partly due to the constraints related to their primary fuels, which is coal. Coal takes a lot of water uh, to uh, cool and both India and China are water constrained, so there's that aspect. There's a number of different aspects that would potentially cause them to take a more uh, pro-gas approach. Um, there's a lot of gas in Australia and Southeast Asia, um, but those projects are very big and very expensive to develop, so uh, we would see that happen in this world. Russia and um, China have been in prolonged negotiations over uh, big gas pipeline contracts, uh, and those uh, negotiations um, have been at an impasse for some time over pricing. Um, so in a fast blue world, we would see a resolution of that, and as a consequence, you would see large vol volumes of gas moving from Russia into China. Um, there are a lot of places in the world in which gas is available, but the pipeline network doesn't exist to really bring it to market. And that's particularly true in parts of Latin America and in Africa. And so we would see that pipeline network build out over time and make gas more uh, available. 
We would also see um, Atlantic LNG, um, particularly from Qatar, willing to provide that spot market flexibility instead of creating what they call these destination clauses, which they determine what the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the off-taker should be. In, instead, they would uh, continue to uh, sell on the spot market, which provides more flexibility in the gas market. And then finally, um, the oilage linkage would weaken in Europe um, and create uh, more incentives for utilities in Europe to switch to gas. So if you bring all of these things together, you could see a lot more gas come into the marketplace. And then finally, the Middle East and the Caspian, there's a lot of gas in Iraq, in Iran, um, and in the Caspian. So you would see the pipelines in those systems being able to deliver a lot more gas uh, into Europe. So with those uh, eight elements, we would see a world in which uh, gas would be abundant uh, and at reasonable prices. Now, when we model this and look at um, what the, um, the implications are for um, electricity, um, you can see what, I've, what we've done is calculate uh, the consumption by fuels. And um, <clears throat> what's interesting in that global grind case that I mentioned, in which you have a weaker economic growth, um, less um, pro-gas policies, you would see that coal uh, would continue to dominate as a fuel out over the next 15 years. Whereas in a fast blue world, um, just at the tail end of this period, gas would just begin. Now, most people don't realize but coal is the dominant fuel in the world. And um, there's it, it's a very long time before renewables can even come close to replacing that. And so the, the really the big, um, I would say, battleground in the world over the next 15 years is really between coal and gas. And the question is, is which one of those fuels is, is going to, to win out? And coal has lots of advantages. Uh, it's abundant, it's relatively cheap. Um, and the constraints on uh, uh, coal are, are mostly being imposed in countries that aren't building a lot of new capacity. And so uh, you have to do a lot to, to, to shift that, uh, that uh, outcome. But um, just in terms of the total amount of capacity, it's pretty amazing. Between uh, now and the year 2025, we expect between 55 and 90% uh, increase in the installed base of electricity around the world. There is a, a mega trend of economies moving to more electrification. So a tremendous amount of electric capacity is being built around the world. So uh, turning to wind and solar, um, one of the things that's interesting is you often hear of these conversations very um, uh, distinct. You hear people talking about gas or you hear people talking about wind and solar. And those conversations uh, often do not intersect. But there's actually lots of ways in which gas and renewables are complementary. Um, one is central uh, and the other is distributed. Um, gas is actually quite flexible. It can help uh, back up uh, renewables. Um, gas is a proven technology. Renewables uh, are proven to some extent, but not quite as much. Um, and uh, gas obviously is not zero carbon emitting, but it's certainly much less than coal. Um, renewables are zero, so if you bring those two together, you can have a lower uh, carbon footprint. So there's a number of ways in which these uh, technologies are complementary. Um, and so I think one of the next waves over the next 15 years is really uh, the challenge of expanding the synergies of these technologies. And that's bringing together um, elements of the electrical infrastructure, which is the, uh, the transmission uh, and the distribution with information technologies, and then bringing together the wind and the solar with the flexible uh, gas turbines. And really the interesting kind of engineering and policy uh, challenges are really bringing these capabilities together. And uh, this is another area where I think the United States is at the forefront of testing out some of these uh, opportunities to create these synergies um, in an integrated uh, fashion. And I'll just give you the example of, uh, of solar um, and gas integration. And there's really two points of integration that you can think of. One is, um, the size of the technology, whether or not it's a centralized 
or distributed, and then there's the point of integration. It's either at the plant level or at the system level, and I'll just walk through quickly. Um, at the system level, you can have uh, heavy-duty gas turbines that back up large arrays of solar, right? And so this is utility scale. Um, and then at the, uh, <coughs> if you have many rooftop, which would be distributed on the solar side, you can still help to balance that system with these heavy-duty gas turbines. So that's a, a, a situation in which um, you can have the integration. Another is at the plant level. Um, and so we're actually experimenting now with what we call integrated solar combined cycle, where you have a, <coughs> um, a combined cycle plant with um, these uh, solar thermal uh, plants. And by integrating these technologies, you can essentially have baseload uh, power almost. And then at the distributed level, you can have rooftop with microturbines. Um, so there's a whole array in which uh, gas can be integrated with solar in interesting and uh, dynamic ways. So I think that this is an area uh, that um, is really um, open and, uh, and exciting for uh, further research and deployment. Okay, now let me turn to uh, water, and there's lots of things we could talk about uh, water, but one of the areas that I'd like to focus on is on unconventionals. Um, we see when we look out into the future that um, unconventional fuels are gonna make up a larger and larger proportion of the supply mix. And the reality is, is that unconventional fuels require more water uh, for extraction and processing. And um, we see that in the future, the unconventional oil space, uh, it's gonna make up about 34% of the incremental oil demand and on the gas side, we expect that unconventional gas will make up about 40% of the incremental gas demand growth. So there's a bunch of water associated with it. And the question is, is how much? So we've been doing analysis in the United States of how much water is required to extract these unconventional fuels. And what's interesting is um, because of the pricing differential, and <clears throat> you have to understand that um, fracking can be used not just for gas extraction, but also for oil extraction. And right now there's a big differential between gas prices and oil prices. And this chart, which shows how much water is required for that fracking process, clearly shows that the Balkans is the, actually the largest source of water. The reason is that the industry is shifting to extract liquids, right? Because they're more vi valuable in the marketplace right now. Um, but on a total basis, uh, the United States requires about 120 million barrels per year to extract the current levels um, of fuels coming from these unconventionals. And so the question is, is how much is that? Is that a lot or not? Um, and so we've gone through and analyzed the frac stages that are associated with each of these fuels and then estimated the amount of water that is required for the injection. And so this shows um, 2010, 2015, and 2021 for each of these uh, field plays, and then the amount of water that's uh, associated with that. But what's interesting is it turns out that it's not that much. When you look at the total amount of water that is used in the United States, uh, about 45 to 50 percent goes into power generation for cooling. Um, other includes industrial and agriculture. Mining is actually just 1% of the total water use, and fracking is just a fraction of that 1%. So in the news, you hear about this issue, and you read about it a lot, but the total amount of water that's associated with it is actually relatively small. Um, and in fact, we compared it to the amount of water that New York City uses. New York City, on an annual basis, uses 13 billion barrels per year. By contrast, um, U.S. frac fuels uh, require, in 2010, about 1.4 billion barrels per year. So that's about 11% of New York City's annual consumption, right? And then if you project out into the future, to the year 2020-21, uh, we estimate that that'll increase because the industry, the fracking industry is growing, but it will um, 
only be about 27% of New York City's water supply needs um, today. So I think the takeaway I get from doing this analysis is that um, it, it's the, the size, the volume of the water isn't that. You know, obviously it's distributed and there's a, a, a lot of work that needs to be done to set up the, the regulatory and um, uh, mechanisms to address this, but um, the volume of water that we're talking about is, is really not um, that big a scale. It's something that I think that we can manage with existing uh, technology and engineering know-how. So um, on water, um, there's a whole variety of uh, techniques that are being used uh, in terms of hydraulic fracking, enhanced oil recovery, steam generation, hot water treatment for oil sands that you hear about in Canada, and then upgrading bitumen in oil sands um, places like Venezuela. Um, so there's a whole array of water technologies. And water is interesting because there hasn't been that much investment and, and, and that much innovation in the water space. But I think over the next 15 years, this is going to be a growing area because water constraints are becoming more binding. And so I think this is going to become an increasingly interesting area uh, going forward. Finally, let me... Uh, look into the, the digital wave. So uh, everybody here knows about uh, the rise of Google, Apple, and uh, Skype, and all of these social media um, uh, inventions, and, and it has made our lives uh, very interesting and exciting. Um, but what I think is even more interesting is the convergence of these technologies with big infrastructure. And the question is, is what is going to happen over the next 15 years or so? And what does, or is it possible for the rise of an industrial uh, internet? And what would that look like? And what would we gain from that? You know, the dialogue in, in, in the public arena has really been around demand side efficiency. But there's a whole host of things that we can do on the supply side uh, to enhance efficiency. And uh, harnessing some of these technologies may be an interesting way to get that. And let me talk about a few of them. And that is, um, we have many large plants. These can be power plants. They can be petrochemical plants. There's a whole array of large industrial facilities that are needed to run uh, modern economies. Um, but these plants are antiquated in the sense that they're not fully outfitted with sensors, um, data collection, analytics, to be able to help enhance the performance of these uh, facilities. And so there's all sorts of ways in which uh, embedded software uh, and special purpose electronics can be used to better optimize the performance of plants. And so we're doing a lot of work in this area to try to uh, enhance uh, the performance of uh, faster starting plants, optimizing um, a whole host of uh, interesting applications. Um, <clears throat> And this has to do with really fundamentally asset optimization because what a plant manager wants is to understand that plant really well, but he also wants to know, or she wants to know, uh, how that plant operates within the system that exists, right? And so it's that information flow. And I think there's this emerging technologies from the social and commercial uh, media that can be brought in to the industrial space to enhance the flexibility of operations, the degree of automation, uh, improve business analytics to help people understand what kind of decisions um, they can help to uh, make more intelligent uh, decisions and forecasting capability. Also to detect problems before they occur so you can do the maintenance before you have a catastrophic failure. All sorts of ways that you can enhance the efficiency and productivity and performance of assets. Um, there's also ways of um, creating platforms that are necessary if um, things like electric vehicles are really going to take off um, in the world. You know, one of the challenges is uh, how do you create these charging stations in which if you go visit a friend or you go to a, a different city, that when you plug in, you're charged properly for that. Um, and that requires a whole host of technologies to get that billing system put in place. So that's a whole nother set of applications in which um, that EV uh, technology probably wouldn't be accelerated if these weren't uh, available. And so <clears throat> that requires 
um, uh, connections to financial mechanisms, right? And connecting into there. So it's not just the energy technology itself, it's how you um, enhance payments and things of that nature. So there's interesting work being done in there, particularly with fleet vehicles, rental uh, um, agencies and whatnot, really may be the vanguard of, of um, electric vehicles uh, around the world. So with that, I'll uh, wrap up and, and turn it over to questions, but let me just uh, emphasize, in the next 15 years, I think the global energy system is going to see uh, constraints intensify, which um, can create some daunting challenges, but it also uh, creates some interesting engineering and technical opportunities for, you know, because there are big problems out there to solve. Um, shale gas, I think, is set to have global implications. Um, technology and smart policy, I think, uh, need to be deployed to mitigate some of these water risks that I mentioned, particularly around the fracking area. Um, this industrial internet, I think, is, is very exciting and could be the next wave of uh, innovation. And uh, in many of these areas, the United States has an opportunity to lead. And I think uh, universities like Princeton are uh, a great place to study some of these problems. So with that, let me turn it open to uh, some questions. Thanks. Well, I think um, what I was trying to do is, is, is get a sense of the scale, right? And I, I, I get your point that um, you can contaminate larger uh, volumes of water, and that's where you need uh, smart policies and smart tech technologies to come in and make sure that that doesn't happen. And so for this fast blue world to evolve, I assume that those better technologies and uh, policies come into play. I think that uh, it will require uh, more monitoring, um, oversight of the industry, um, and those things are beginning to play. But I think the, uh, the technologies, many of them already exist. It's a question of deployment uh, more than uh, really some next wave of innovation that needs to come to play. So I think the point is, is that it's, it's, a, it's a problem, but it's a manageable problem. That's correct. And I'm kind of curious if you might put together a, what we would call a green scenario, fast green, mm -hmm. and uh, how would you uh, optimize that? Yeah. Um, There's been a request for you to repeat the question. Oh, yeah. So um, the point was that we had the, the global grind and the fast blue. What about a green scenario? We actually do have a green scenario. Uh, we call it changing climates. Um, the challenge is, is that you know, when you do scenarios, you want to make sure that um, you're studying things that you think are plausible. And over the, <laughs> the last couple of years, unfortunately, um, the signposts for that fast green world don't seem to be emerging. So it's a conceptual, we have it, but, you know, we're in the business of informing uh, our senior leadership about which worlds seem to be evolving. And um, you have to, when you're doing strategy, you have to make a distinction between a normative analysis of what you would like to have happen versus kind of a realistic view of plausible futures that could evolve. With all due respect, I, I don't think carbon intensity is the key. I think total carbon emissions are the key. The atmosphere doesn't really care, you know, what our carbon intensity is. All it knows is how much carbon actually went in the atmosphere and what the resulting warming is. Um, so when you say that a fast green scenario would not be plausible, I mean, companies like GE are the huge, you're huge, 
you drive technology, in many ways, you, de you decide by your policy, by what you do, what is going to be possible. That's, that's so a gracious, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a gracious <laughs> way of thinking about it. And GE has been very proactive. In fact, um, we were a leading member of US CAP, which was an initiative in Washington, D.C. To, to try to convince policymakers to adopt um, uh, a carbon regime, um, and that didn't bear fruit. And so, again, I think when you're doing strategy, you have to uh, uh, look at well, where is the world moving, and uh, you have to distinguish a normative position versus uh, how the world is playing out. And so, I mean, that's, that's how you stay in business and uh, operate. But do you really think the world can double its, more, more than double its carbon emissions by 2025 and nobody's going to at some point realize we've got to stop this? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to get enough governments to agree to do something about it. That's what's really hard. That's why we're not in the private sector to take the responsibility. Yeah, they can. So when you do your scenarios, are there any, you know, are there one or two or three really disruptive things that you kind of, you know, put in very low odds but very high impact? Um, well, yeah, well that's always a challenge. Um, the question was, uh, when you do scenarios, how do you deal with wild cards, which are low uh, probability, high impact events? Um, I tend to build, I think it's best to build your scenarios around megatrends. Um, and then deal with those kinds of issues as side sensitivities. So what would you do to uh, uh, disrupt, you know, what are the things that could disrupt that, that mainstream activity? And you find that it's hard to see over a long-term trajectory when you're looking on a global basis things that, that fundamentally disrupt the system. You know, I would say the biggest probably impact in the last several years to the global energy system um, was Fukushima, right? Because it has changed the trajectory of where people thought nuclear power was going. And uh, if Japan doesn't restart its nuclear reactors, uh, you're putting a lot more pressure on the gas markets in Asia. Um, and you're raising prices. And so that actually uh, mitigates against the fast blue world that I'm talking about. Because people will not switch to gas. They will remain on the coal path. Um, if prices stay in the $15 range is which where they are at right now. In fact, for a fast blue world to really take off, you need to bring gas prices down to $10 to $8. Um, and we're seeing China begin to really look at building out its unconventional gas. Um, they have a lot. In fact, uh, some estimates are that they have more unconventional gas reserves than the United States does. And so if China were to really develop its unconventional gas, you could see China shift uh, to a much stronger gas uh, future. And so there's some interesting dynamics along those lines. But um, I guess the uh, Arab uprising last year, you know, the Arab Spring, uh, had an impact on uh, oil prices. So that was a bit of a shock. But uh, in the big scheme of things, these tend to have a temporary blip, and then you go back to the, the main trajectory. And, you know, going back to the previous comment, you know, it would be nice. We would actually like it. Our portfolio is well set up for a fast green future. I mean, we have a lot of renewables in our portfolio. Uh, we would benefit from that, but we don't dictate how the world unfolds. And so um, doing strategy and making your bet is really an alignment between what the external environment is and what your portfolio is. And so tracking where the world is going is, uh, is, is very uh, important. And I think um, a lot of people are, are seeing uh, maybe a transition from um, kind of an idealistic green future to maybe a more realistic blue uh, future. Yes, um, but there's a caveat in that most oil goes into transportation, and so um, the, the impact is actually <laughs> there's more oil uh, being drilled today than there has been in like 20 years. Um, as I mentioned, the Balkans, there's a lot of oil, and so there's been a resurgence 
in uh, oil development in the United States and our imports are down uh, quite considerably. Um, and in fact, some people are saying on kind of long term um, with the uh, new discoveries in North America, particularly Canada, um, that the oil capital of the world will shift from the Middle East back to the Americas. You know, the United States used to be the largest oil exporter in the world, and that, that fell off in the, from the 1940s on. But uh, with Canada, uh, the United States, and Latin America, Brazil, tremendous amount of oil that they have. So uh, the, the world is shifting in terms of where that oil is, and uh, um, it's, it's creating uh, important shifts um, in the global energy markets and geopolitically as well. <laughs> Would you care to ask your question? Yeah, you were speaking about the complementarity between natural gas and renewable energy because of the intermittency and the, the lack of storage solution for renewable energy. Now there are a number of solutions in the offing, like for example molten salts and, and GHC, uh, uh, electrical cars, the battery technology developed, uh, uh, or in the Middle East, desalinated water. So uh, do you see maybe also a scenario where, where kind of renewable energy could, could stand their own ground? And what would you require in, in, in the form of mean regulations and lavish subsidies? Because you say you are not dictating where the energy train is going, but of course you are influencing <coughs> via a, a, a lobbying work in Washington and so on. So what would be your wish list there for a more green scenario? Well, is it technologically feasible? Right. I, I, I I, um, I think you have to be very realistic um, about the debt burden that the OECD countries face um, right now. Um, Europe um, is in a very challenging situation in terms of their jet debt to GDP ratios. Japan's is astronomical. The United States um, is, is, in a, is also in a, in a challenging situation. So as long as renewables require some kind of subsidies support. And I think that all indicators are that you need some kind of policy support to sustain these technologies vis-a-vis -vis fossil fuels. You need some kind of government uh, intervention. And if you're not going to have a, a kind of a carbon uh, regime that will drive that, you need to find some other vehicle. And some countries have used feed-in tariffs as a mechanism. Um, but I think that uh, the notion that there are going to be these vast amounts of uh, government support for renewables is a, a challenging proposition. So um, I think that renewables have a place in the uh, energy s system. Um, and there is a certain level of support, particularly in certain countries like Germany and elsewhere. But it's not broad scale. I'm trying to paint a picture of what's happening globally around the world. And people pick out certain markets to make their points. But the, the fundamental reality is, is that these policy supports do not exist uh, broadly across the world. And they're very niche. Um, and uh, they have a, 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 you know, a marginal uh, implications for what really is being invested in on, a, on an annual basis. Yeah, um, we don't have oil prices going over $120 in the high case, and they drop into the maybe $70 range. So we are we have moved into a new pricing regime for um, oil, um, but we don't see we we haven't constructed a scenario in which oil prices go to $200, and uh, we don't see in the next 15 years a kind of a peak oil situation. Uh, emerging. There will always be geopolitical disruptions, you know, Nigeria or Iran or whatever along the way, and so there's a, always a, a bit of uh, um, volatility in oil prices. Uh, you know, it's hard to imagine in the next 15 years for um, uh, gas to move in in any significant way into transportation. Um, it's just, it's a niche application in many cases. Um, there's 
seems to be fairly abundant uh, uh, oil available. Um, and so, um, it, it, and there's always downward opportunities, right? So if they see competitors, they can, they can drop. So uh, I think over the next 15 year horizon, uh, that's not a big, big challenge. You, oh, sorry. Go ahead. We do all of that. So, um, you know, to build the uh, power, power generation model, you look at historical data, and um, we benefit from having a very large uh, commercial sales force around the world, and they have intelligence about what is being built in these countries. Some markets are, are a little bit harder to model because um, they don't behave in, in, in the way that economics would predict. Um, institutional, for institutional reasons, they uh, have a hard time building to the actual need. Um, and so they're in chronic shortage. India is a great example um, of that. So you have to go in and actually modify the model based on what you know about those countries and make realistic assumptions. So the modeling is actually uh, part the results of uh, you know, statistical uh, evaluation of what has happened in the past plus overlays. And then in the energy space, it's complicated because there's lots of policy overlays. Uh, for example, nuclear power, you can't really model that. It is dictated by government policy, so you have to have some judgment as to what countries are going to do. And then renewables are another complicating factor because that's also driven by policy. So to really do a, a, uh, a reasonable job of modeling uh, complex systems like that, you have to bring in to bear all of these factors. And, you know, we've been doing this for years, so we, we hope we've got uh, uh, some good experience doing it, but it's, it's never perfect, and so you, you try to improve it every year. Uh, so I'd be 35 in 2025, and <laughs> I'm kind of wondering, you know, what my future would look like. And so you have that interesting graph where you have coal um, and natural gas, basically natural gas starting to take over coal. And I'm kind of trying to think for the second half of my life. Do you see that trend then continuing until, you know, by some miracle we come up with another source of energy, maybe Peter uh, takes off with their fusion projects? Because I kind of see, you know, from my perspective, it's not a very bright future. You know, it's, it, it's a nice pretty slide, but it's scary for me to think that natural gas is the future of our, uh, you know, that's kind of the key to energy. Um, so I'm kind of, it's kind of a double-edged question and also the sense of what high-risk, high-yield uh, areas are G is GE interested, if anything, uh, you know, along kind of like from a DARPA perspective uh, sure. in terms of new energy sources. Yeah. Um, so question is uh, new energy sources, breakthroughs. I mean, we're constantly monitoring that space um, and have um, a global research center in upstate New York plus affiliate research centers in Germany and uh, we're just building one in Brazil and in China. So we try to keep our pulse on uh, breakthroughs, um, but you know these are kind of wild cards you have to watch out for. But it's hard to imagine something because the scale of the global energy industry is so large. You know, I try to present that to you at the beginning by by indicating that it's a trillion dollars a year in energy infrastructure is built. You know, and in the existing asset base is multi trillions of dollars. So even if there was a breakthrough tomorrow, it would take decade or more to have even a marginal impact on that. So you're talking very, very large scale systems and to change those large scale systems dramatically uh, takes a whole lot of time. And frankly, right now we don't see on the horizon ma you know, really, really big uh, game changers. The other thing I'd like to say is, is this fast blue world that I, uh, I laid out is not inevitable. Um, and in fact, there's some challenging issues in actually getting the amount of gas that I mentioned. And so in many respects, what I've just laid out is an optimistic view um, of, <laughs> of what will happen over the next 15 years. Um, 
I think we're going to have to, to close now because Peter has to ca catch an airplane. Um, and so I'd just like to thank you again for really sure. stimulating. Thank you.